Welcome to Cynical Celluloid, where devastation is a delight. This episode, we're buzzing off back to the 70s, the decade where natural disasters hit the screen like a Category 5 hurricane, which, coincidentally, there occasionally were, and they were the feature. This episode, the Africans are coming as a wave of aggressive bees brings something far less pleasant than sweet, sweet honey. Death, destruction, a more winged pests than a raid factory can handle. In Owen Allen's bee movie, The Swarm. Investigating a military base they've lost contact with, they find a lot of dead bodies and very few survivors. Brad Crane, an entomologist, is found in the base. His investigation of a new threat has become very relevant all of a sudden, as a huge swarm of killer bees have begun to attack, having not just taken out the base, but a couple of helicopters and a picnicking family. With reluctance, General Slater and the army have to follow Crane's lead as he fights to stop the Africanized bees, while avoiding committing a blow to the rest of nature in the process. But the clock is ticking. The swarm is becoming more aggressive, and once it's done with the peaceful rural town of Marysville, its next stop is Houston. I kind of hoped you'd pull it off. Please arrange protective crating and the two oscilloscopes and personally fly with them to Houston. I'll see you there with the tapes and the rest of the equipment. I'll be there. The 70s were quite the heyday for disaster movies, though they of course never went away. They even enjoyed quite a revival in the 90s, but they never quite dominated the cinemas quite like they did back in the 70s. Airplanes and blimps were getting hijacked or crashed, earthquakes rocking cities, floods sinking ships, and even killer pathogens from outer space, oh, and piranhas and so many more things. The humble bumblebee didn't escape the trend either. A million little Jaws-like creatures took to the skies to terrorise the masses in at least three or four movies over the decade. And The Swarm? Well, that's one I remember standing out. Probably because it boasts quite the cast. At the time when Hollywood studios were really cashing in on big-name disaster movies, The Swarm boasted Michael Caine in the lead and a supporting cast including Henry Fonda, Richard Chamberlain and Slim Pickings, amongst a sea of familiar faces. Uh, did it do well? Well, The Swarm is a very odd movie in many respects. On one hand, it wasn't like in a budget, bearing in mind that these movies were just cheap to make back then and budgets weren't in the crazy state that they are these days. The Swarm had a pretty decent $21 million behind it, from what I can find at least. That's just shy of about $100 million today given inflation, and it really does show. The sets may often border on the cliché with a spinning reel-to-reel -reel approach to sci-fi tech, but the visual effects are generally pretty good. And what you'd expect to see from quality 1970s SFX in general, though the giant bee hallucinations are kind of hilarious. When the action isn't happening, the swarm falls very, very flat though. I have to preface this criticism by pointing out that there are two versions of this film. There's a shorter theatrical cut and an extended version that adds some 40 minutes. It's basically 40 minutes I probably could have done without. The reason I say this is that The Swarm is quite a ponderous movie. As is the way with many of Hollywood disaster productions, there's a lot of the getting to know the victim stuff going on, and it really spends a lot of time on that stuff that doesn't drive the plot in the slightest. I'm a little loath to say this because I generally feel that like character development is so incredibly important, but here... Well... <sighs> They spend a lot of time on tertiary characters that really have little impact, if any, on anything. As way of an example, we have a love triangle going on between three senior characters, members of the community, that takes up, well, quite a lot of screen time, only to have them driven off the cliff in a train crash caused by a bee attack. Now I see the point of this stuff. The film is trying to make us feel the impact of the attacks, but oh my god does this miss the mark as the story gets ground to a halt on so many occasions. At the heart of the story are some rudimentary ideas and intents. There's a environmental concern that's expressed through Michael Caine's character, Crane. That's there, but it doesn't really play out fully. Well, it doesn't at all play out fully. Unfortunately, it comes much more off like a conceit to extend the story with its plan A versus plan B structure. 
that unfortunately makes the hero look like an asshole on both counts. His environmental concerns with the softly softly approach result in the swarm simply carrying on and ignoring his poisonous food plan, which then now means that there's a delay until plan B, no pun intended, is implemented. This results in the bees now being magically immune to the more aggressive approach that may have worked earlier. Plan C doesn't exactly sound environmentally friendly either as it involves setting fire to a large area of sea, but hey. I'm sure the American beans were fine at least with this plan. I mean, fuck the fish and the seabirds though. Uh, yeah, the environmental angle, it, it just doesn't hold up. Suffice to say the swarm is a bit broken and unfortunately it's very goofy where it should be hitting home. The drama often falls flat, mostly because there's so much going on around the main story that the emotional impact is flattened by, well, well boredom, caused by things like the love triangle and the boy's quest for revenge and so on and so on. Incidentally, the boy in the extended version ends up getting killed in a death scene that was excised from the theatrical version. I can see why it was cut for the cinemas. It's kind of downbeat for too many members of the audience, I would imagine. But it does introduce the idea of the poisonous stings causing a delayed relapse. This is mentioned outside of that scene, though it is kind of important to show. It's probably one of the very few reintroduced scenes that really does matter in any way. From the ultra doll love triangle to the merciful but late and comical train crash, and of course many of the extra dialogue scenes. The boy's death isn't the only moment to darkness in the story though, but generally they barely land in this ludicrously crowded movie. There are several hints of an unfulfilled heavier tone, a suggestion that something that would rival the likes of the Andromeda strain, uh, with its far straighter face and somewhat more horrifying drama. But the swarm really does fall into those familiar mainstream Hollywood tropes and tones, whilst also struggling with sustaining momentum, which even in the shortcut is the film is just often very, very slow. I'm pretty sure there is a more efficient cut in there, but this is the thing, even in the most efficient cut I can imagine, the swarm just doesn't really have enough to grab and hold on to its audience, in my opinion. I can't say it's the worst film of its kind at all. It does hold a degree of entertainment, even if sometimes it's for the wrong reasons. But the story seems to run out of steam by the end of the first hour. Then it just kind of bubbles along and sputters out at the end. And oh, yeah, the finale is some way short of being a payoff for your patience. There's just all that waiting. The performances go all over the place with some very solid and a few certainly not. Came for his part shifts from being quite an engaged person at moments to just shouting a lot. Suffice to say, this is Kane in full cliche mode. And the less said about some of the tertiary turns is probably for the best. To be fair, for the most part, it's decently performed with a few standouts, but like the tone of the movie, it's inconsistent at best. One moment above all else highlights just how ridiculous this film can get. Crane flying in a helicopter that's dropping poison bee food hovers must, what must be a couple of hundred metres over the swarm of bees on the ground. He looks through his binoculars and somehow can see and realise that they're not eating the tiny, tiny pellets. I mean, them some fucking good binos, man. This is before we get to the use of flamethrowers in the city and even more unreasonably inside the building the army are based in. And it's quite clear that the film is lost in its own hyperbole. I mean, I'm not expecting a documentary here. It's a disaster movie. And the most documentary disaster movie I can think of is Threads. And quite frankly, I don't need that. I'm here for a bit of fun after all. But a little grounding does go a long way. The problems though were numerous. The comedy unintentional. The action sparse and the pacing is broken by too many dead ends in the story. And there's just not enough excitement to make up for it all. It also wants to take itself seriously. The boy's death and the eco message indicates that much, but it likely would have been better set as a more frivolous offering, as much as that irks me to say it. It seems to me that the main cause of this is less in the direction than it is in the writing, as everything kind of meanders around aimlessly, and there's a lacking of direction in the plot progression. The result being that everything feels like a first draft at best, an outline at worst. That's not to take all the blame off the direction of the film, though. There's a certain responsibility on the director's part to make things fit together. But given the material, I'm not sure this mess was all that recoverable from the level of the screenplay. 
given how fragmented much of the film feels. Some of the performances that were committed to screen, well, that is to some degree the director's fault. I say this not to take the load off the characters, but because there's a sense that they seem to get a bit lost in regards to where their characters are in the story. Kane in particular is a really good actor when he has solid direction, but here, well, the character is a bit all over the place. He himself has expressed how little he really cares for the film, and given how his delivery goes from utterly baffling to pretty captivating from scene to scene, I do get the feeling that he was at a loss as to who his character was half the time. Compare and contrast the time he's engaging with the army versus the scene where he mourns his friend's death. It's illustrative of where he understands his character and where he's just trying to get the take done. I guess this rather sums the film up. It feels a lot like the film is trying to justify its existence, while the main point of the film isn't substantial enough to do that job itself. It's moderately watchable despite this, but it's not really the kind of film you'll spend too much time thinking about after. In the huge body of disaster films that the 1970s spat out, The Swarm is a surprisingly underwhelming and uninteresting effort. B-minus.